Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Goblin Hideout, the NFT finance podcast. I'm Helmas and joined by my co-host, Terry. Today we have on Putty Finance. Tama, good to have you here. Maybe first things first, can you uh, provide just like a little introduction of yourself and tell us a little bit more about the project you're working on? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me here. I'm Tama Gayaki or Tama, one of the co-founders of both Putty Finance as well as Kali Finance, pretty focused on options products for NFTs. So we just released our version one of Putty, which focuses on put options for NFTs a couple of weeks ago. And we're getting pretty close to releasing covered calls product for NFTs called uh, Kali, which we're pretty excited about. And so, yeah, we've been working on these, you know, two projects for a couple months now. You know, the genesis of the, the idea is always centered around like our personal experiences, sometimes picking NFTs that didn't exactly take off. So we wanted to like write puts on them or, you know, like being able to speculate on the price movements of an NFT collection we were bullish on, but maybe couldn't quite afford at the time. So like kind of seemed like a natural fit when we didn't see a product that actually existed that did that quite well. So we decided to create our own and here we are a couple months later. Awesome. Yeah. Glad to have you on. And maybe Tommy, you can just kind of like kick it off and tell us a little bit more about uh, like what you were doing before you started Putty. And I guess we can maybe roll into kind of the the vision for Putty, I would say, over the coming months? Sure, yeah. So for for myself, you know, my background is in parallel computing. It's what I've done for my entire, like, professional career outside of crypto. I got into crypto a couple of years ago, right, kind of before the last major run-up. I think it was, like, 2017. And initially, I got in on the speculative side, as a lot of people do. After a little bit, I, I met out. He's been developing for quite some time. I think, you know, like there's a lot of experiences that he's had about like developing early stage and like, you know, the early days of Ethereum. And so we got together, started talking, and then I started getting to into the programming side, you know, learning Solidity and all that. Started doing some private projects, looking on chain. And then eventually we started to build, this is actually like the first public project I'm releasing. It's, it's like the third that out is, um, but the first one that has like gotten some traction. And so, you know, we decided to start working on that together. And and from there, you know, the rest is basically what I said earlier. Um, For like vision, you know, right now the NFT space is not the most like uh, sophisticated in terms of the financial offerings for people that, that own NFTs. And obviously a lot of new primitives are being built out now. Like the lending space is growing and it's pretty competitive. There's a lot of like you know, different approaches, whether it's like peer-to-peer, like NFT Fi or like some of the other ones, like Great Inner Abacus pairing up together or something like that, or JPEG even. Um, so lending has been pretty big, but but outside of that, there's not that much uh, being done for like derivatives, options, that kind of thing. There's a couple of per protocols that are being worked on now, but but nothing for in the option space. So we, you know, our vision is to become the like one-stop shop for everything options related for NFTs. And when I say NFTs, I'm talking about NFT specifically, but also like the ERC-20 representation of an NFT that you can find at someplace like NFTX, basically. So, you know, what we're trying to do is create solutions for people to hedge their risk and speculate uh, through like complex option strategies. And and that's what we want to be. That sounds great. And maybe kind of like next line of questioning, we can dig a little bit more deeper into the uh, protocol itself. I think providing just like a general overview of, of the model like I know you have a, a Alice and Bob kind of example in the white paper. Is that something you could maybe speak about to our listeners? Yeah, for sure. I think there's actually like kind of two flows that we can talk about. One is the put side and the other is the covered call side. So I'll start with the put because maybe it's a little bit easier to visualize. On Putty, a user has the ability to purchase a put option on their NFT. And so what that basically means is they have, they have the ability to buy insurance on their asset. So if they have an NFT that costs like 100 ETH, let's say, and they like the NFT, they want to hold it, but they're worried it's quite volatile. So they want to be protected on their downside. So they purchase insurance at a level of 80 Ethereum, which means that if the price of their NFT drops below 80 Ethereum, they can sell that NFT to someone for 80 Ethereum. 
So they're basically protecting their downside and they pay a small premium for that privilege. And so they can, they can buy insurance on like a weekly, monthly, whatever the, the time period is. And they wait for someone to come in on the other side and agree to fill that order. Uh, because it's like purely over the counter right now for putty, we've been seeing a lot of larger groups that are interested in, in buying and selling puts. So for example, we just recently did a deal with FloorDAO where they sold put options, they sold insurance for five forgotten rune wizards to a, a private buyer. So the buyer was basically interested in buying insurance on those wizards and they contacted us. We talked to Florida and, and Florida decided to fill the, those orders out. So you can really think of like, like I said, the put is basically just purchasing insurance on your NFT to protect your downside in case the price drops in the collection. On the covered call side this is the second product Kali that we're getting like, we're finalizing the audit now and the test net is public. It's basically a way for someone that owns an NFT to earn yield on their asset. So if I have like 10 NFTs in my wallet and I use one as a profile picture or whatever, but the other nine are just sitting idle. Uh, maybe they don't have like uh, pools in NFTX that you can deposit into, or, or maybe they do. The, the point is, if you have an NFT, usually you can't earn yield on that asset well. But if you deposit into a Kali vault, you basically define how much yield you want to earn, whatever, like 0.1 Ethereum, 1 Ethereum, whatever the target that you want, and a duration. And once you define that duration, and a reverse auction starts with like an extremely high strike price of like, let's say like 500 Ethereum. And it goes down over a 24 hour period until someone decides, oh, this is a good time to step in and buy that call at like, let's say 20 ETH. So they basically pay you a premium to have the right to buy that asset from you at a later date. And if you price the vault correctly, you can ensure that it has a very low chance of, of being exercised by the buyer. So you're basically earning consistent yield on your NFT. So it's like, it's like a way to earn yield every week or month or whatever the time frame may be. And at the end of that like cycle, a new auction starts up. So you, you just get to harvest the yield you earned in the last cycle and you get to start earning yield again in the next cycle. So like those are the kind of two products that we've developed so far. They're both pretty early stage, but we want to offer something that both people, like people that are looking to protect themselves as well as people that are looking to earn yield on their NFTs, there's always going to be something there for you. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I think that's like a great overview. And I guess like going further into the protocol design, like could you let us know specifically for the sort of protective puts and selling puts position? Like how does that work with the vaults and you know like Alice depositing the NFT, et cetera? Like can you walk us through sort of what a user might go through? Sure. So for a putty, yeah, like let's say I own an NFT or, you know, I don't even need to own the NFT, but let's, for this first example, say I own an NFT, I can create a put contract where I specify like some strike price that I, I don't want the NFT price to drop below. And I specify a premium I'm willing to pay and a duration. And an order is created and broadcasted in the putty UI. And a seller can come along and look at that order and decide, okay, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take the opposite side. And so they'll deposit the ETH collateral into Putty's contract. But at no point in time is, this, is the NFT itself actually deposited into the contract for, for the put option. The user can own their NFT, keep it in their wallet, whatever. At the point that they decide that the NFT is now worth less than the strike that was agreed upon, they can click exercise. And at that moment, the NFT will be sent from their wallet to the seller's wallet. And the way we keep track of all of these things is we mint long put option NFT and a short put option NFT and give it to each of the, to the buyer and the seller respectively. So the person that bought the NFT is minted like a long put option NFT that represents their position in this trade. And the person that sold the NFT is minted a short put option NFT that represents their position in the trade. And those things can also be traded around. They can be bought and sold as well. So like there's potential for like a secondary market on top of that. But essentially, the NFT holder, when they decide to exercise, that is the only time that they actually need to own the NFT that they've bought the put for. So it also allows you, like, if you really have high conviction on this one collection, like going to the ground, you can create a put option without actually owning the NFT right now. And like a month from now, if the collection did indeed like shoot super far down, you can buy that NFT much cheaper and then exercise the option and make a profit that way. So like, 
that's kind of a typical flow and and how everything is organized on the put side. Got it. Got it. So it's kind of like selling like a naked put versus buying a protected. That's Mm -hmm. right. You can do both. Yeah. And sort of on that note, I'm guessing then like the contract has some sort of like require that you own the NFT, right? Like that's how it would work in order to sort of exercise the option, right? That's right. So like that's what I meant when I said like you can trade the position. I can, you know, buy a put option for a specific NFT and then trade that like position to that owner at a later date, you know? So like, there's all sorts of things you can do with that. But yeah, you don't actually need to own the NFT until the point of exercise. Got it. So I guess for someone who has then sold the put, and <laughs> excuse me if I'm like confusing selling and buying, but for the person that doesn't have the NFT, then the contract logic doesn't require that they have the NFT. But then if you bought the put, then, then you do have to have both the NFT as well as sort of the, the put option ERC721, right? If you bought the put, you don't necessarily need to own the NFT at the time that you're buying the put, at the time like that the order is filled. You just need to own that NFT when you choose to exercise the order. Got and the, it, got seller, the seller has already deposited their ETH into the vault for the put option at the time that they filled the order. So if they were to sell their like put option in the future, it would be for at least whatever they deposited into that vault, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. How do you guys decide then if the option is like in the money? Right. So as you guys are, I'm sure are aware, the Oracle space for NFTs is not super developed. Like Chainlink has their product that like JPEG and a couple other people use. And there are some like ML, like APIs out there that you can use to price your NFT. But right now, because there's no sophisticated Oracle, we don't want to like limit our users from being able to do anything. So, and we were taking an approach of maximum flexibility because like I said earlier, the types of deals we're seeing are between two large, usually sophisticated users that have a lot of experience pricing their own assets. So like, we don't want to put any limitation on when something should be exercised or not. It's completely determined by the buyer of the NFT for put options. So like it, they need to decide, like, okay, it's time to exercise now. And whether that's based off of the like floor price, if they're doing like a floor NFT put option, or that's based on their own like internal calculation of what the value of the NFT is, that's up to them. Now, I will say that like in our next version, we're going to create like a product that is purely around the floor of an NFT collection. So instead of having to own a specific NFT and create a put option for that specific NFT, you can create a put option for any NFT in the collection. And so if you're like flipping, I don't know, punks, let's say, you can buy insurance on the floor price of punks and then flip the floor as much as you want. And whichever NFT you happen to own at the time that the floor price drops below the put option strike, that's where you can like exercise with whichever one you own. So it gives like even more flexibility there, which is quite useful for like people that trade floors, I would say. So I think there's like a really good segue into the V2 launch that maybe that's what you were alluding to. And then just curious, in the future, are you, will you guys be servicing like a peer to pool model as well? For Putty V1, it's basically like an MVP. All you can do is you can create a put option for NFTs or an ERC20 and then have someone fill the order. That's it. Part of the reason we separated like our covered calls product is because we view it in like a in a different way than just a whatever naked call or put option or whatever. So we have Kali separate from Putty as two distinct products. So while Kali tackles the covered calls using an auction mechanism, Putty V2 is going to have functionality for both puts and calls, as well as creating like not just having the buyer be the one that creates the order, but also having the seller have the ability to create the order. So like you have people that can like offer to sell you a put and then it's basically the opposite flow as if it were someone like creating a buy order. So that's all going to be in V2 as well as like the floor options that I was talking about earlier. And in terms of peer to peer versus peer to pool, it's like a pretty interesting dilemma, honestly, because you have like a couple of different ways you can view it. Peer to pool obviously gives convenience, right? You just dump your ETH into a pool and it sells whatever put contracts or call contracts or whatever. Or if it's going to be call contracts, then you'd be dumping NFTs into a pool. But you know, with NFTs specifically, it's quite hard to set up a pool because unless you're dealing with the floor of a collection, people have an attachment to their NFT or they value it at a specific price above what the floor is. So for that reason, like V2 is still going to focus on a peer-to-peer approach. But 
the stuff that we envision for our like kind of an end state is to have a pool option for floor NFTs and have a peer to peer option for non floor NFTs. But again, like it's still something we we spend quite a lot of time thinking about this specific dilemma because there's so many ways you can approach this problem and there's like a, some pros and cons, right? Like what I said, you know, it's convenient to have a pool because you abstract a lot of the work that a, a put seller, for example, would have to do. But on the other hand, that takes away from the sophistication of what you can create in that put contract. So yeah, like kind of a give and take and, and we aim to offer both, but for slightly different use cases, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And when you were mentioning B2, right? I'm looking at the roadmap here. Right, you have calls, counter offers, floor options, and then the last thing is sell side capital efficiency. I was just wondering, like I did play around with your calculator function a little bit, but so like, what are you referring to when you say sell side capital efficiency v two? Sure. So I, I don't want to like speak too much on it, but the easy solution is to start increasing the efficiency is to have like a deposit into a yield earning protocol like Ave or Compound or whatever. So already the seller is like. It's not static, their collateral, but it's earning yield for them while also, you know, being deposited into putty and allowing them to earn a premium. So like that's kind of some of the capital efficiency that that we're trying to work on because that'll be translated into better pricing of the put options. Since, you know, you don't need to decide anymore, do I put my Ethereum into Aave or do I put it into putty? You can do both at the same time. Like that's first step, which is not going to be that difficult to implement. But beyond that, we've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about how we can do like a under collateralized option, um, because obviously in traditional finance, there's a, a big emphasis on under collateralization and how that works with loans or options or whatever it may be. And so the deal with that is that it relies on trust in TradFi. And so how can you simulate trust in a trustless environment? This is like a key problem that we are working on. And we have some ideas, but I'm not sure like I'm quite ready to share because like uh, it's still a little bit away from when we actually start working on that. And we want to focus on making the best product for people at that time. So like short answer, deposit into another protocol that earns yield. Long answer, under collateralization through like a specific mechanism that's designed for that. I guess like, I don't know if this is the right way to think about it, but is it kind of also from like a, a seller's or buyer's perspective, like abstracting away sort of the cost of capital. So you don't have to do that calculation when you're sort of deciding whether or not to go into this trade. Right, exactly. And like, um, you, let's say, you know, this kind of brings it back to that floor option uh, that I was talking about earlier. Imagine like you don't own a floor NFT of any kind, but you think like, okay, miladies, let's say you were big brain. I knew they were going to double recently, right? Or, or maybe now you're thinking like, oh, they're going to go down by a lot or whatever it may be. You don't need to own Floor Milady. All you need to do is create a option. And then let's say when you click exercise, a flash loan is taken out that purchases the NFT, sends it to the seller, takes the ETH that the seller had provided from the vault, repays the loan, and you're left with just the profit. So you don't need to manually do any of that. So speeding up that those types of processes is like exactly what we're focused on for V2. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And something I was a, a bit curious about that I definitely want to ask you guys is like my understanding of a lot of borrowers on NiftyFi today is that they're essentially like buying put options, right? Like at LTV, that's like the strike. You know, they're paying a premium of APR. And sort of the main difference I see in Putty is that the premium is guaranteed. Whereas in NiftyFi, I think if you default, like you don't necessarily have to pay the sort of APR. Like, how have you guys thought, thought of that? Like, do you think there's a lot of people who are kind of going to migrate over to Putty? Or like, have you guys looked at sort of like capital efficiency on NiftyFi if you look at it from an options perspective? Right. So we've looked pretty extensively into NiftyFi in the past and quite recently as well. And what we're seeing is a lot of the loans that are getting accepted, like if you run it, I know you said you took a look at the calculator we had provided. If you run it through that calculator, it's like grossly mispriced for a lot of these loans. And that coupled with the fact that like all a loan really is, is the ability to use capital up front as opposed to waiting, like a put option you need to wait to exercise. But like for someone that's lending out Ethereum for an NFT, their best case scenario is a put option because they get the premium up front. And they know if it's exercised, they're getting the NFT as well. Whereas in a loan, you have the NFT as collateral, but you're not so sure if you're getting the premium is if they choose to run away. So like a loan and a put option is like a pretty similar instrument, I would say, 
but there are some subtle differences, which is why we are pretty excited about our put option offering because we think it's like a little bit more attractive. And like, you can even push it further where you can have lending platform and even one that does peer to pool. And right now you see like the loan to value ratios are quite bad, but what if the borrower, in addition to submitting their NFT, also submitted a put option on that NFT to the lender? So they've paid that premium upfront and that put option guarantees the collateral on the other side. So you can get like 80, 90, hundred percent LTV, right? So this is like one thing we we're like pretty bullish on is like having NFT lending platforms integrate a put option. I think defrag has implemented something like that, but they use a black Scholes calculator to automate it. We think maybe there is a solution in there that has a little bit more of a nuanced approach. Uh, that can be implemented over a wider range. Kind of similar to what Abacus is doing, but in this case, it's a fully collateralized put option. So you can have like whatever percent loan to value you're actually comfortable with. So like that's how we're thinking about it at least. And and when you said that like a lot of these Nifty Fi loans are mispriced, like how mispriced are we talking about here? I've seen some that are like 20x what they should be. Wow, so like, okay. I mean, it, it's kind of hard, right? Because when it's peer-to-peer, there's like a, and if you offers like a lot of flexibility, so you can like say like, I want any loan over any duration or whatever, and then people start bidding on it. But usually like when someone has a preferred option that is for, for what their loan wants to be, it's like more often than not, there's some edge to be extracted there. So if anyone will like, <laughs> the calculator is perfect. So like if anyone wants to take a shot at that, let me know how it works for you guys. Got it. Wait, so we're yeah. talking like 20x mispriced on volatility is what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much over the duration that wow. they've requested. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's quite insane. Yeah, I imagine like Goblin Sachs is also like <laughs> bearing some of those fruits as well from your lending perspective, but it's there for the taking is what I'm trying to say. It's just like in a time of extreme volatility, you might want to be a little bit more selective, right? Because right, for sure. you can always make a positive EV decision. At the end of the day, in an extremely short term without a lot of like sample data, you're still going to wind up Uh, losing some of the time. So it's just like picking your spots of where you want to capitalize on that mispricing. But like with a large enough capital pool, yeah, like you should be raking it in right now on on Nifty Fi. Yeah, maybe we just like take this part out of the podcast and the editing procedure, right? Yeah, (laughs) that's the thing with crypto, right? Everything's public. So go ahead, like take your shot. Cool. And, And then maybe we can shift a little bit more. I know you had referenced some tokenomics in the Cali documentation regarding like fee sharing and governance. Maybe you can touch base a little bit on that, Tama. Yeah, sure. So nothing's set in stone right now. Every time I talk to anyone about tokenomics, like I always say like, no need to rush on this, right? There's no point in just releasing some premature token that ends up harming the protocol in the long run. But for Kali specifically, we think like a token is actually quite useful for like a, a governance of a kind. like. Obviously, when you're dealing with transactions like options or even in a DEX with swaps or whatever it is, there's usually a fee that's slapped on top. Right now, for both Putty and Kali, we have we have 0% fees. It's free for anyone to use. I don't know if you guys have read, there's this good article on like how, what a hyperstructure is. And um, basically, like what we're trying to emulate is creating an environment that people can build on top of, as well as not have to worry about additional fees. With that being said, governance would be used to decide if the fee is turned on or off or how much the fee is, that's like something we personally don't want to decide. We want to relinquish that control to the users of the platform or the holders of of the token. So that's like the initial tokenomics ideas. But again, caveat, like big grain of salt here, like not super confirmed on that because there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we have to get set up before we can launch a token and what capabilities that token can have. But that's how we envision the token actually working for Kali. Like, I don't want to say too much, but you should use Kali at the start, like when we launch. Is it, not you specifically, but like, and people should use Kali at the start. I think is probably a, the best way to put it. Like, even in ERC twenties, like we haven't seen a lot of volume on options protocols, right? And then on the other side, in Nifty Fi P two P, like these loans are just taking off now. Like Nifty Fi is kind of exponentially increasing their volume now. Like, how do you bootstrap more liquidity and more usage for something that's, I guess, kind of early? I think like one way to do it is the way you approach like who you're 
target market is at the start. With an early product and with in an early field, I think NFT owners are kind of split up into, well, obviously it's way more diverse than this, but let's just for simplicity say, call it two main categories, which is NFT native and crypto Twitter native. Okay. And I think like the crypto Twitter side of things is a little bit more DeFi heavy. So they've had the experience of using some DYDX or whatever, and also depositing into DEXs. Like they know the score a little bit more. For NFT first holders, it's a little bit different. I think like the way you would target them is to really make the user experience as easy as possible, as friendly as possible, and show them that like instead of betting directionally by actually purchasing an NFT or selling an NFT, you can for the fraction of a cost do the same thing. Or like if we're talking specifically to our products, it's very easy to just to, to say to an NFT owner, hey man, like you're kind of you know chilling on a bunch of NFTs right now. Why don't you deposit it and earn some some yield? We'll help you define your risk. I think that's the biggest thing is like assisting in like defining risk tolerance because you can earn a lot of yield on Kali, but you're more likely to get exercised and lose your NFT. So if you like if you limit the amount of yield you actually want to earn, the call option itself would be further out of the money. But okay, like moving beyond like our protocol specifically, I think the important thing is to figure out what makes each like target market unique and how you can best reach that. I think like going to NFT collection owners and also like focusing on collections that are quite like a crypto native, like Nouns DAO, Wizards, Miladies. These are ones that a lot of people that own them are also semi to fully experienced DeFi users. So it's about like picking your battles and deciding like who is going to use it today versus who's going to use the product six months from now. Because like if NFTs take off or if you know the UX gets a lot better and more people that can understand what's going on with all these protocols, like if Curve updates their UI, like all that stuff, right? Like it's time to approach people differently at that point than than what we would be doing now, which is hitting the people that have had experience already. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Let's maybe like take a step back and zoom out a little bit, and maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about where you see NFT finance today, maybe where you see it going over the next year? Obviously, right now, the last couple of months, there has been an explosion of new primitives for NFT finance being built. Like I think a good example is the AMM that Pseudoswap's building, right? This is like a new take on how to transact NFTs or NFTX even, right? The way that they have structured their pools, you know, tokenizing the ERC-721s. I think those two, and, and in general, like, we're at a point where a lot of there's a lot of room to build, like a lot of things need to be built out in the NFT space in terms of financialization. As I said earlier, like lending has already taken off in conceptually. A lot of protocols are interested in building out lending products. We saw like JPEGs launch recently. Um, I know like the Gradient plus Abacus teams, they're, you know, they're getting ready for their own public launch. So like in general, I would say lending is pretty saturated, but beyond that. You know, there's a lot of room, like it depends on what you, the, the goal is, right? But it's easy to pick something in traditional finance or pick something that has been built out for ERC-20s and say, well, how can this be translated into an NFT? And I think that's fine. And I think a lot of protocols will do that. But I also think there's room to get a little bit more creative. Like, for example, your Uniswap V3 position, the range or whatever, it's represented by an NFT or even like in PuTTY the put options themselves, the long or short positions on them, they're represented by NFTs that are minted. So like you can create the original primitive, but you can also build on top of what has been created and create markets for those NFTs. Like I think that's kind of one NFT utility that I see kind of increasing is NFTs being used to represent positions in something in crypto. And so like, uh, yeah, I think building for that is probably the next step. But right now, obviously, the space is just exploding with new protocols having their own spin on a different like financialization take, like perps, like options, lending, whatever it may be. Just on that note of sort of NFTs denominating like claims or or Uniswap V three positions, like what's kind of like something crazy that you think people might use Putty plus some NFT with? Right, like imagine being able to purchase an option on your Uni V three position. So like at that point, you're deciding what the yield of that position or that range or whatever will be. That's just a simple example. And, and to tell you the truth, I don't even know how far it can go. But certainly 
what Out and I are trying to build is like the full suite for of options, it's like all the exotic options that you may have seen or might have read about an institution transacting with. Like, you know, I was just actually talking to Out about this earlier. You know, there's like a twin win option. You know, there's like wedding contract. There's something called like an I will kill you later option, <laughs> which is insane. <laughs> I uh, so, like, don't want to settle on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, there's all sorts of like niche options that have been used in traditional finance, but those are usually barred from like retail participating in them. And having like NFTs that represent different positions in different protocols or different options strategies themselves, it just opens the door for a lot of those to be implemented for regular people to use. And obviously, like the complexity is there. So the challenge is translating that complexity into an easy to understand use case. Where do you see Putty sort of fitting in into the space? Like it's going to be just like a long shout out, but like when NFT finance is sort of institutionalized and people are actually transacting on it, there's enough liquidity. Like what do you think would have been the journey? Oh man, like we started out building this thing to create like a way to hedge our risk. And that was it. We were like, we're going to be power users of this protocol and we're, we're not going to get rugged anymore. Like that was the whole goal. And it, over the past couple of months, like I would say 50% of our time is just spent talking about new ideas and lending and credit and even just strictly options. So I guess what we see is creating products that NFT owners can use point blank in order to increase their yield or protect themselves, which is like the start of that has been Putty V1 and this protocol Kali that we're launching. But beyond that, like we want to make it so it's easy to use. But once people start using it, like it's kind of they can't imagine going without doing that. And, you know, integrations come to mind as a way to achieve that. So, for example, how sick would it be if you're on Gem and you purchase an NFT and then there's a UI, like a small pop up that's like, hey, do you want to like stake this NFT and start earning yield on it? Or even the same thing on NFTX, right? These are things that we're starting to get into discussions with protocols like that to start pushing those integrations forward. Because ideally what an NFT owner wants is a way to view all their NFTs at once, stake their NFTs to earn yield and sell them easily. So like, that's kind of the goal. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess it's also until, you know, when you've been like selling all these puts and harvesting the premiums and then you just get wrecked. So like, how do you guys approach education? How do you guys approach sort of making sure people understand the risks? At this point in time, it's probably not an issue. I, I understand, right? But then like in the future, when you guys are working towards making this integrated with other protocols, like how would you approach that? Like you said, right? Right now, most of the volume that we're dealing with is on like the DAO level or institutional partners, people that have experience and, and don't need the education. But the goal, obviously, is to make this accessible for everyone. And I think the way you do that is through abstraction. So like if you're on OpenSea and you similar to the gem example, if you're on OpenSea and you buy an NFT, then like there could be an option, like a one-click checkbox where a premium is quoted to you and it's like, would you like to buy insurance for a month on this NFT? You know? Like Apple Care. Exactly. Or like a like a plane ticket where they offer insurance at the end. Something like that where you don't need to set a specific strike. You don't need to set a specific premium. Everything is given to you and you need to just say, yes, I would do this or no, I wouldn't. I think that's like kind of one way. And on the education side, it's just publishing good documentation. But beyond that, like I think visual documentation is the best. So like tutorials, walkthroughs, that kind of thing. And that that will right now attract people that are kind of dipping their toes into DeFi and own some NFTs. But in the future, I think like to really attack the larger market, it's going to have to be like an easy integration like what I just mentioned. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess sort of to round it off, like, First of all, thank you for your time for being here today. Before we call it a day, like, where can people learn more about Putty? Where can people contribute? Is there anything that you guys want to put out there to the world? For sure, for sure. So yeah, the Putty Twitter is Putty Fi, P-U-T-T-Y-F-I. Uh, we have a Discord that's pretty active. And like, our goal is always to release test nets publicly before we launch a full product. And there's like a subsection of our Discord that is solely focused on testing the application and providing feedback. And if you provide actual feedback, it's 100% being implemented into the protocol. 
obviously like if a bunch of people are saying the same thing, then, you know, that's something that needs to be changed. So like we're building something for people to use and we want it to be the easiest experience possible. So come into our discord, comment on our test net. We have links to all our documentation, all our application interfaces, the black Scholes calculator that, you know, we were talking about earlier. Everything can be found either on our Twitter or our Discord. So, and you can get to our Discord from the like standard like Twitter page. So, yeah, come join us. We'd love to have anyone that wants to experience what trading options on NFTs is like. So, yeah, that's basically I think the easiest way. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, really appreciate having you on. And again, anyone who's listening in, feel free to just yeah go jump in their Discord and and check out Putty. Thanks for joining. This is the Goblin Hideout, the NFT finance podcast. Thanks.